Thank you so much, Jill, for that generous introduction. Um, it's really an honor to be introduced by someone whose work I admire so much. Um, I also want to thank all of you for coming out on such a cold day, um, and to sincerely thank everyone here at the Radcliffe Institute, uh, who not only have made this talk possible, but have welcomed my family and me so warmly here in Cambridge, and who have worked every day to foster really a remarkably supportive atmosphere among the extraordinary fellows here at the Institute. I'm immensely grateful for my time here. Thank you. The story I'm about to tell you began at the dinner table. My father is a rabbi and a Bible scholar, and we were enjoying a Friday night meal, and I was telling him about a series of articles I'd been writing about the recent discovery of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat in Turkey. Uh, you might have noticed that someone finds Noah's Ark every year. Um, and this discovery, like the rest, turned out to be a hoax. And I was writing about it, and I mentioned it at dinner, and my father said, you want to hear about a real biblical hoax? And he didn't know it then, neither did I, but that simple question would come to dominate my life for the next five years, uh, launching me on a hunt through eight countries on four continents as I tried to solve the riddle of the enigmatic man at the center of this alleged deception. That man was Moses Wilhelm Shapira, an antiquities dealer from Jerusalem, and his story begins in the summer of 1883 when he shows up at the doorstep of the British Museum in London claiming to have in his bag the oldest biblical manuscript in the world. Shapira, who was a Jewish convert to Christianity, was by this time well known to the British Museum. Over the years, he'd sold them many important and authentic biblical manuscripts, but this manuscript was different. To begin with, it was extremely old and almost illegible. In fact, Shapira said, it was an original copy of the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth and final of the five books of Moses, also known as the Pentateuch or the Torah. It was discovered, he said, by wandering Bedouin in caves near the Dead Sea. And almost as shocking as an original copy of Deuteronomy was Shapira's asking price. He wanted an astounding million pounds for his find about $250 million in today's money, which was more than anyone had ever paid for a piece of the past. The world freaked out. Not only did Shapira want a wild sum of money for this document, but the text itself was wildly different than the traditional text of the Torah. And in 1883, this was an explosive proposition. If the oldest and hence most original copy of this biblical book was different from the traditional text used in churches and synagogues around the world, then it stood to reason that the Torah, as people knew it, hadn't been handed down from God to Moses word for word before the children of Israel crossed into the land of Canaan. That's as tradition had it. Rather, it indicated that the Torah had changed and possibly had been changed by human hands. Shapira's arrival in London could not have been better timed. Britain was just then in the throes of a Bible craze, captivated by a cadre of Protestant theologians, most of them from Germany, who had begun to question the divine authorship of the Bible. Indeed, the very year Shapira came to London, again, 1883, Julius Wellhausen, father of the documentary hypothesis, which posited that the Torah was not originally a unified book, but in fact had been assembled by a number of editors from several shorter books, that year, Wellhausen published his definitive volume on the matter, making his case so powerfully that it had snared the attention of British scholars and laymen alike. Just a few years earlier, the heresy trial of the Old Testament scholar William Robertson Smith had concluded a multi-year case that in the end saw Smith facing just one charge relating to the date and authorship of Deuteronomy. And now here was Shapira carrying what appeared to be the original book of Deuteronomy, furnishing proof for some of these new theories, but also evidence that other critical theories were mistaken, in particular the assertion that Deuteronomy was a late addition to the canon. Shapira became an overnight celebrity. Newspapers covered his every move in their literary gossip columns. He became a sought-after dinner guest all over London. Back home in Jerusalem, his family blew exorbitant amounts of money on credit because they were about to become the richest family in the whole holy city. The Prime Minister of England, William Ewart Gladstone, himself visited Shapira at the museum and examined the manuscripts and asked a number of highly informed questions because, as it turns out, he could read biblical Hebrew. And he was so impressed by what he saw that day that he departed the museum and reportedly 
started raising the funds himself to ensure that England wouldn't lose out on this fantastic relic to its international competitors, Germany and France. While all this was going on, the British Museum hired one of the great Bible scholars of the day, a man named Christian David Ginsburg. Uh, contemporary reports indicate that he was less fuzzy in real life. Um, he was hired to decipher, transcribe, and translate Shapira's manuscript. And the version of Deuteronomy that Ginsburg found was very short and very strange. There were numerous changes, omissions, and additions to, to the traditional text, but most radical were the alterations made to the Ten Commandments. These laws, as you may know, form the foundation of the Judeo-Christian ethic, which today shapes the worldview of nearly a third of the planet's population. Any changes to the holy text were shocking. But if the Ten Commandments could be altered, moved around, and added to, as they were here, everything else would seem fair game. In Shapira's version, the exhortations against worshiping other gods and crafting idols are melded into a single edict, reducing the traditional Ten Commandments to nine. The scroll's author then adds a new final commandment, borrowed from another biblical book entirely, that's Leviticus' well-known exhortation not to hate thy brother in thy heart. The punitive portion of the commandment against idols, in which God vows to visit vengeance on the descendants of idolaters, is plucked from its traditional spot in commandment two and moved into number seven, which now threatens such retribution for the descendants of those who make false oaths. The book of Leviticus was a ripe source for the author of Shapira's scroll. The commandment that forbids taking God's name in vain is replaced with a synonymous phrase from Leviticus chapter 19. The Decalogue's trio of two-word commandments is expanded by phrases from elsewhere in the Torah. The statute against adultery includes a line from Leviticus 20. Now instead of the time-honored do not commit adultery, the law reads, do not commit adultery with your fellow's wife. Don't murder becomes don't murder the life of your brother. Don't steal is rendered here as don't steal the wealth of your fellow. The command to mark the Sabbath is replaced with the version of that commandment from Exodus, in which the Ten Commandments also appear. But where Deuteronomy orders the children of Israel to observe the Sabbath, and Exodus insists they remember it, Shapira's version exhorts the Israelites to sanctify the holy day. As he worked away on this manuscript, Ginsburg occasionally stopped to record his discoveries, which he published in the Times of London and in the Athenaeum. And remarkably, he also used the Athenaeum to publish the text of the manuscript itself in Hebrew, which meant that readers of this mainstream English magazine knew and understood biblical Hebrew. After four weeks of excitement toiling away in the bowels of the British Museum as Shapira soaked in his newfound celebrity, Ginsburg finished his work and announced his verdict. And it was this, hold your horses. Shapira's Deuteronomy manuscript is a fraud, it's a fake. I should say here, this is a cartoon from Punch Magazine, uh, and it represents a lot of the way Shapira was reacted to um, in the scholarly community in London. You'll notice uh, he's being held captive by Ginsburg there on the left, and he's, of course, presented in profile with a giant hooked nose and scraggly beard. Uh, although he converted to Christianity, anti-Semitism would dog his reception for the rest of his life. Uh, now, Ginsburg said that the scrolls were not ancient, but rather had been sliced from the blank lower margins of a Torah scroll, You'll see this is what it looks like inside a Torah scroll. The words are written in vertical columns, and along the bottom there's a blank margin. So Ginsburg said that blank margin at the bottom was sliced off and then inscribed. And this argument is bolstered by the fact that as an antiquities dealer, Shapira had dealt for many years in very old Torah scrolls, and so would have had access to such material if he wished to slice off their lower margins. That's the external evidence, the appearance of the manuscript. Uh, Ginsburg's internal evidence was more technical, but the conclusions he drew do not require a PhD in ancient Hebrew. The scrolls, he reported, were forged by a gang of no fewer than four people, two scribes who did the writing, a chemist, and what he called a compiler, the group's boss, who not only called the shots on what text was to be included, but orally dictated it to his scribes word for word. Even more remarkable, taking note of a number of telling spelling errors, Ginsburg named both the geographic origin and religious faith of the compiler. He was, Ginsburg said, a Jew from Poland, Russia, or Germany. I should mention here, I should mention also, by the way, that uh, Shapiro was born in, uh, in Poland, in Kamenets-Podolsk. So the clear reference here was to Shapiro. Uh, 
Later critics also pointed out a series of grammatical problems in the manuscript, and one particularly embarrassing instance where two letters got switched, a mistake that left God himself not getting angry, as it is in the traditional text, but committing adultery. <laughs> Ginsburg's condemnation came just a few days after the French archaeologist Charles Clermont Ganneau had taken to the pages of the Times of London and himself condemned Shapira's manuscript on fraud as frauds on similar grounds. Gano had hardly seen Shapira's scrolls before labeling them as fakes, so his arguments were less thorough than Ginsburg's. But even so, Shapira was shaken. That's because he already knew Gano and hated him deeply. A decade earlier, Gano had also publicly attacked Shapira for dealing in forgeries of a different kind. That debacle began with the discovery of the Moabite stone in 1869. The Moabite stone was a large basalt monument inscribed by the Moabite king Mesha with the story of his people's rebellion against Israel, familiar to some of you perhaps from chapter three of Second Kings. The stone was remarkable because its inscription offered the first confirmation of a biblical story outside the Bible itself. And the discovery launched a new craze in the region for all things Moabite or Moabitica as it came to be known. And with this craze in full force in 1872, more than a decade before Shapira turned up at the British Museum with his Deuteronomy scrolls, local Arabs began arriving at Shapira's shop, stooped beneath bags full of clay relics they said had been dug up near the site in Diban, in modern Jordan, where the Mesha Stele had been located in 1869. Lieutenant Claude Condor, who I should mention has since been floated as a possible Jack the Ripper, so take this with a grain of salt. Um, but Condor was then leading the Palestine, uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund's survey of Western Palestine, and he described the reception for Shapira's new Moabitica this way. The talk of Jerusalem and of the travelers then crowding in and around it was the great Shapira collection. The collection included a rogues gallery of bizarre pieces possessed of what Condor called a grotesque uncouthness all their own. There were cone heads with lips turned up in spooky smiles, a disembodied cranium, its long tongue dangling like an exhausted dog's, odd stone heads, distended faces with tiny eyes and giant noses, clay men in full expression of their sexual prowess besides sculpted women with crudely formed genitalia. Pots and jars and urns arrived each day at Shapira's shop, and as puzzling as their odd forms was the curious writing that adorned some of the relics. They were emblazoned in a script nearly identical to the Mesha Stele's ancient Hebrew, might these words, people wondered, tell a similar story, confirm another biblical narrative, explain aspects of Mesha's religion. The Stele had shined a light on the region's history, and Shapira's collection promised to do the same for Moabite culture, which had until then remained obscured by time. Shapira's pottery collection grew fast. Tourists and scholars chatted about the stuff over drinks at a lawful local coffee house, and debated its meaning in the lobby of the Mediterranean Hotel. Some curious Jerusalemites even made the pilgrimage to Shapira's shop to see the pieces with their own eyes. Among Shapira's visitors was a German cleric named Hermann Weser. Weser made sketches of Shapira's new acquisitions and dispatched them to a German scholar named Konstantin Schlotmann, who had already written extensively about the Moabite stone and had, from the beginning, hoped that its discovery would herald more such finds in Moab he proved a most welcoming audience. Working from Weser's drawings, Schlotman began to publish details of Shapira's finds. He theorized that the statuettes, many of which were undeniably crude and ugly, were none other than shikutsin, a disparaging term for idols used frequently in the Bible, notably in Kings and Ezekiel, uh, uncovered now for the very first time. More daunting than identifying the pottery was interpreting its, in its inscriptions. The Moabite stone told a story a tale of war between Israel and Moab. The writing on the pieces in Shapira's collection made no sense at all. While the letters were recognizable, they did not form any known words to say nothing of sentences or stories. Rather, they seemed to have been randomly dropped onto the pottery. For Schlotman, this was evidence of a previously unknown Moabite language. And he went energetically to work deciphering this language. He managed to decode a word here and there but by all accounts, his efforts were strained. According to one scholar, for his readings to have been correct, the scribe would have had to be writing simultaneously in two different scripts, 
one of which did not yet exist during the period when the Moabite pottery was thought to have been created. And those were the easy pieces. Many of the inscriptions simply proved indecipherable. Nevertheless, Shapiro's collection of Moabite statuettes continued to grow, and Schlotmann, in his position as secretary of the German Oriental Society, recommended that Prussia purchase the available pieces for its royal museum. After a long tug of war that had led to the Mesha Steely being blown up by local Bedouin, only to be pieced back together and displayed at the Louvre, the Prussian government, eager now to outmaneuver the French, jumped at Schlotmann's suggestion, naming Shapira as its official agent. In the autumn of 1873, Prussia purchased the first collection of 911 pieces, followed in short order by a second set of more than 700, paying Shapira the astonishing sum at the time of 20,000 thaler, about $235,000 today. So taken were the Germans that Kaiser Wilhelm I himself donated a portion of the money to ensure that Shapira's collection reached the fatherland post-haste. Now Shapira was moving up in the world. He moved into a lovely home outside the walls of Jerusalem's old city, and he even got an impressive new pet, a giant, nasty-tempered ostrich, uh, who occasionally escaped its pen in the backyard and had to be corralled by Shapira's broom-wielding maid. No sooner had he sold the first two collections to Prussia than he began to assemble a third. But as this new collection grew, so too did doubts about its authenticity. Uh, much of the early concern focused on the sheer volume of material that was landing in one man's lap. No one had ever before discovered inscribed pottery in Moab, and now suddenly there's no end to it. The proposition struck some as suspect. In a letter home to the Palestine Exploration Fund dated June 19, 1872, the English explorer Charles, Charles Turwick Drake foreshadowed some of the arguments that, we, that would be leveled against Shapira a decade later, the kind we just saw in the cartoon from Punch Magazine. He wrote, Shapira's being a converted Jew goes much against him, but I believe him to be ignorant of any forgeries if such are carried on. In Germany, meanwhile, the majority of scholars had by now concluded that Shapira's pottery was fake, an opinion echoed by the French archaeologist Gano. In December of 1883, Gano published a long letter in the Athenaeum in which he not only labeled the Moabitica a colossal deception, but offered up the name of the deceiver. He wrote, my opinion is, and always has been, that the collections of M. Shapira, all derived from the same source, are false from beginning to end. In short, Gano concluded, I did not see in the whole collection one single object which could be regarded as genuine, so that I remarked when we came out, there is only one thing authentic in all that we have seen, the live ostrich. <laughs> when he read Gano's attack, Shapira flew into a tantrum. He crushed the magazine in his hands, twirled it onto the table, and over the coming days, a steady stream of visitors marched through his home. Clergy, ministers, and missionaries huddled in his office in what were called a series of solemn conferences. But whatever counsel and comfort they offered could not mitigate the shock of Gano's very public shaming. In Prussia, the purchase of nearly 2,000 pieces of Shapira's now dubious Moabitica was such a blow to national pride that the controversy made it all the way to the parliament, where Professor Theodore Mommsen, who would later go on to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, spoke passionately about the affair, acknowledging the error and forcefully questioning the process by which the pottery had been vetted. Following his speech, the majority of the Moabitica was officially declared fraudulent. Shapira was aggrieved and aged by the scandal. His wife, a German, a German deaconess named Rosetta, was also shaken. Oh, my poor children, she said to the couple's two daughters, Gano will certainly be the ruin of you. And so a decade later in London, when Gano barged in with his condemnation of Shapira's latest find, the Deuteronomy manuscript, an attack that was soon followed up by Ginsburg's dismissal, Shapira was inconsolable. Humiliated, he ran away from England. He did not contact his family. He is said to have visited a number of European cities, leaving luggage behind at each stop, writing letters, but never mailing them. And in March of 1884, he took a small room at a seedy hotel in Rotterdam, raised a pistol to his head, and pulled the trigger, ending his life at the age of 54. And people thought that's where the story ended. Shapira had forged the manuscript, tried to sell it to the British Museum, and had been caught precipitating his suicide. 
But fast forward 70 years to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, many of which were biblical manuscripts and considered by some to be the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century. Recall now that Shapira's Deuteronomy was said to have been discovered in a cave. So too were the Dead Sea Scrolls. Shapira's manuscripts were full of departures from the traditional biblical text. So too were the Dead Sea Scrolls. Shapira's strips were found by Bedouin wandering the desert near the Dead Sea. So too were the Dead Sea Scrolls. Shapira's manuscript was a copy of Deuteronomy. Among the Dead Sea Scrolls, Deuteronomy was the second most numerous book after Psalms. Indeed, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls six decades after Shapira's death had led some scholars to reopen the investigation of his strange Deuteronomy, whose dismissal all those years earlier, they now believed, might have been tragically premature. It was even possible that Shapira had found the first Dead Sea Scroll 60 years before the rest. But there was a problem. In the 62 years between Shapira's death and the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Shapira's Deuteronomy had mysteriously disappeared. No one knew what happened to it. It simply vanished. And that's where I come into the picture. Once I heard this story, I decided that I needed to find the missing manuscript and prove once and for all if it was real or fake. I began in England, where the scrolls, as far as I knew, had last been seen in 1883. Then over the course of several more years, I followed clues to Israel and Jordan and Germany and France and Holland and everywhere I went, I hit brick walls. Documents were missing. Others had burned in fires. Promising clues turned out to be red herrings. Some people, for reasons that only later became clear to me, were deliberately working to thwart my efforts. In short, I was failing, and I was getting immensely frustrated. I'd traveled to all these countries, wading deep into hidden storerooms at the Louvre and musty English attics and trekking through the flooded Jordanian gorge where the scrolls were said to have been found. But each place I visited, the trail had gone cold. I was panicked. I'd sold the book to a publisher, and it was coming due, but I had no ending. I hardly had a beginning. In short, I was getting very worried. And then out of the blue, on Yom Kippur night, as I was getting ready to leave for the synagogue, I heard the familiar ping of an incoming email, and unable to ignore the siren call of my email, I ran back into my office and found a new note from a man I'd never heard of before, a man named Matthew Hamilton from Sydney, Australia. And what Matthew Hamilton's note said rocked me. It said something along the lines of this. Dear Hanan, I see you're writing a book about Shapira. I've spent the last several years researching him and recently discovered the name of the person who came to possess the scrolls after they were thought to have disappeared. If this was true, it was enormous. I'd been searching and searching, and here was this stranger writing, on the holiest night of the Jewish calendar, no less, to let me know that he knew what happened to Shapira's scrolls. So I wrote back, and I said something like, Dear Mr. Ham Ham uh, Dear Mr. Hamilton, how wonderful that you've discovered the name of the person who came to possess the scrolls after they disappeared. Uh, can you please tell me? the name. <laughs> and then after a brief exchange, during which he did not tell me the name, Matthew Hamilton from Sydney proceeded to drop off the face of the earth. He disappeared. Uh, he simply never wrote to me again, never responded to my increasingly desperate emails over the course of the next eight months. Uh, beyond frustrated, I did what any self-respecting journalist would do. I hired a private detective in Australia to track Hamilton down. And after two weeks, the detective sent me a 52-page report on Hamilton that contained exactly zero helpful information. Uh, there was, for example, a list of 450 people in the greater Sydney area named Matthew Hamilton, and a brief mention of a job he'd held in the library six or eight years earlier. So now I had a choice. I could quit, or I could get on a plane to Sydney and try to find Hamilton myself and convince him to talk to me. So I bought a plane ticket to Australia and flew there, <laughs> hoping against hope that I might be able to track down Matthew Hamilton. Uh, to be perfectly honest, I had no real plan to achieve this. I uh, brought the detective's report with me on the plane and planned to spend the flight scouring it for clues, the way scholars like Ginsburg and my father close read the scriptures. Uh, some tiny connection I'd missed, some name that had escaped my notice, some footnote that on the 10th reading 
illuminated some new idea. As flight attendants rushed up and down the aisles, instructing passengers to straighten their seats and turn off their cell phones, I opened the file. A squat tractor backed the plane away from the gate, and we began the short taxi toward the runway, and I reread a brief reference that previously had seemed insignificant and out of date. I'd seen it a dozen times already, but now its meaning became clear. Some years earlier, the report noted, Hamilton had been employed by the Moore Theological College, a small Anglican school near Sydney. And just like that, I had a plan. It was a bad plan, an inchoate and amateurish plan, but it was a plan, and the plan was this. If Hamilton had worked at an Anglican college, maybe he was Anglican. And where could I find a nice Anglican guy on Sunday morning when I was landing? At church. So the minute I landed, I googled Anglican churches in the greater Sydney area, and within two hours, by a stroke of what I now think is truly providence, I had stumbled upon a man named Paul Berenger, who 20 years earlier had served as Hamilton's pastor. When I told him I needed Hamilton to track down a missing copy of the world's oldest Bible, well, he couldn't resist. This sounds important, he said. <laughs> he had an address for Hamilton. Uh, it was 15 or 20 years old, but it was a start. So he hopped into his maroon Nissan to start searching. And I let the book take it from here. We pulled onto a quiet residential block with no sidewalks. The homes were not fancy, but they were well kept. Lawns trim and green, roofs and driveways in good repair. We crept forward, scanning for house numbers and located, Ham and located Hamilton's two blocks off the main road. Here we are, Beringer said. And then, spotting something as though on safari, look! He pulled quickly to the side of the road, threw the car into park, and pushed open his door. Ahead of him, a white SUV was leaving the curb. Beringer hopped out and took off after it, waving his arms above his head like a castaway who had spotted his passing plane. He didn't stop even as the vehicle turned the corner. A moment later, the car slowed down and the front window came down. Beringer leaned in and began talking to the driver. By this time, I had caught up, and Beringer, head still inside the SUV, grabbed my shoulder and said, just arrived this morning to see Matthew. His name is... Here he turned to me kindly, allowing me to invoke my own name, difficult to pronounce outside the Fertile Crescent, surely more so with an Australian accent. But I hesitated a moment before opening my mouth. I looked in at the driver, a woman in very big sunglasses. I didn't know who she was exactly, but clearly she knew Hamilton. And if she knew Hamilton, it was possible she'd heard of me, the American writer who was stalking him. And if she'd heard of me, she'd know Hamilton did not want to talk. Hanan, I said finally, hi. My name didn't register. He's inside, she said, go ahead in. She pulled away and Beringer sprang to the front door. Who was that, I asked. That was Tony, he said. Leaping onto the porch, Beringer knocked confidently on the front door. She's Matthew's wife. A moment later, the front door swung open. It opened toward me, so I was able to hide behind it for a moment while the two men greeted each other after many years. I couldn't believe my luck. I'd gone to church that morning, hoping to find Hamilton in a public place where he would have to hear me out. Instead, not four hours after landing in Australia, here I was at his front door with his former pastor making introductions. Beringer and Hamilton shook hands and spoke affectionately for a few moments while I stayed put behind the door. Eventually, Beringer turned toward me. Listen, Matthew, this guy here has come an awfully long way to see you, he said. I leaned over, poking my head into the doorway. Matthew, I said, Hanan Tige, the Shapira guy from the US. Hamilton was taller than I am, about six feet. He looked about 35, though in fact he was 51. He had thick brown hair with patches of white at the temples and a thin mustache that didn't so much as twitch as he shook my hand and invited me inside. Ah, yes, he said, friendly as can be. Come in. It was as though he'd been expecting I would show up sooner or later. <laughs> Over the past eight months, I'd thought of Hamilton every day. I had spent hours in front of my computer searching for him, agonizing over his disappearance, imagining what he looked like, parsing his silence, divining his motives. Most of all, I had wondered who had bought Shapira's scrolls and how had Hamilton found out. But Hamilton, it now occurred to me, hadn't thought much about me at all. <laughs> Every couple of weeks, maybe, and then only to decide whether to skim, skip, or delete my latest email intrusion. Hamilton led us through a small living room, past the kitchen, and around a corner, into the narrow hallway that led to the rear of the house. 
Before we'd even reached his office, which doubled as the room where clothing was ironed, Hamilton, smiling pleasantly, drew a line in the sand. I can talk about a lot of things relating to Shapira, but I can't tell you the name. The name, of course, was exactly why I had come. I was happy to talk about anything related to Shapira. My wife might say that was all I ever did. But I hadn't laid down several thousand dollars and flown halfway around the world to chat about Shapira. In advance of the trip, simply finding Hamilton had loomed large in my mind as the biggest hurdle. I now realized that having tracked him down, the real work was only just beginning. I smiled now at his declaration. I thought you might say that, I said. I'm hoping to convince you otherwise. Now Hamilton laughed. I thought you might say that, he said. We entered his office. It reminded me of my own. Piles of books and documents populated his desk, the neon screen of his computer casting its faint moon glow over the bookish clutter. Hamilton pointed out a bookcase packed tightly with what must have been a dozen or more blue loose leaf folders labeled Shapira. Somewhere stuffed in one of those piles or clipped into one of those binders or embedded in an email on that computer was the name. I felt like I had as a kid when my parents took my brother and me to our favorite baseball card shop. I wanted to rush the desk, tear open the folders, and go to town. Instead, I unzipped my backpack and offered Hamilton the gifts I had brought from the US, which included a copy of my father's book about Deuteronomy. Berenger, <clears throat> Berenger excused himself and said he'd call later to arrange lunch. When he'd gone, Hamilton set my dad's book down on his desk. I knew you were serious when I saw who your father was, he said. Hamilton grew up in Parramatta, the second city established in all of Australia. The son of a nurseryman, he'd bounced around this corner of New South Wales most of his life before settling here in Tregear. As a child, he had a photographic memory. That recall no longer comes quite as easily, but his IQ still hovers in rarefied Einstein-like digits. In the late 1970s, while taking the test to gain membership in Mensa, he discovered an error. <laughs> Hamilton became interested in Hebrew and other biblical manuscripts in the mid-1980s when a coworker showed him a documentary called Jesus, colon, The Evidence. Instantly fascinated, he has worked on the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls ever since. He keeps 100,000 photocopied documents related to this research, research through which he'd encountered my father, stored in a shed out back where his pet pig, Oliver, roams. We spent the next hour dissecting aspects of the Shapira story. It was a cordial and interesting conversation, tempered by an underlying tension. Neither one of us sat down the entire time, as though doing so would indicate or precipitate a letting down of our guard. For the duration of our conversation, Hamilton had a little smile on his face. Whatever tension we felt, he was enjoying himself. He spoke extremely fast, and everything he said I interpreted through the filter of the name. He must have assumed as much, because whatever he told me seemed calculated to offer no tip-offs. He delivered a mind-bogglingly thorough analysis of Shapira-related scholarship from the 1880s to the 1960s. Each time he cited a new book or article, I wondered whether that had been where he discovered the buyer's name. Finally, I just asked him how he'd found it. I can't tell you that, he said. There was a moment of silence. What I can say is that he was an Englishman. Now we were getting somewhere. Well, Hamilton said he was from Northern England. I was briefly excited by this divulgence. If Hamilton did not give me the name and all indications pointed depressingly to his remaining steadfastly silent on this point, this would at least allow me to narrow my search to a single country. But beyond that, it was of little value. I wouldn't get far Googling man and Northern England and Shapira. Anything else you want to tell me about him, I asked. I think I've said enough. A few hours later, the front door opened and Berenger hurried into the room. You didn't answer your phone, he said. I apologized and told him it had been turned off while Hamilton and I were speaking. Come on, my wife wants to have you over for lunch, he said. Ah, I said. It was all I could come up with. I was in no way prepared to leave. As long as I could keep Hamilton talking, there was still hope. I had gained access to the lion's den and did not know if I'd ever be allowed back in. But Berenger had been so kind, so helpful, so authentic, that refusing this latest kindness seemed rude. That sounds great, I said. And then to Hamilton, can we continue this later? Of course, he said. How's about dinner tomorrow? This was progress. He was willing to continue talking. Do you like spaghetti bolognese, he asked. 
Two free meals proffered in two minutes. I was starting to like it here. But I had a feeling Hamilton would be more likely to open up away from his own turf, somewhere I could buy him a drink or three to lubricate his persistent misgivings. Please, I said, let me take you to dinner. We made arrangements to meet the following night at my hotel. Then I left for Beringer's house, where over a lovely lunch in his backyard, strewn with toys left behind by his grandchildren, Beringer said grace. He thanked God for our chance encounter, acknowledged how far my journey had come, and offered a blessing for the successful resolution of my search. I'm no Christian, but that was a prayer I could get behind. That evening back at the hotel, I lay down at last, exhausted. Sydney was 17 hours ahead of San Francisco, so I sent my wife the requisite greetings from the future email and began making notes about the day's events. It had been epic. After eight months trying to find him, it had taken just four hours to gain entry to Hamilton's study. He'd welcomed me into his home and offered to break bread. I had the distinct sense that although Hamilton wasn't intending to give me the information I'd come for, he felt bad that I'd traveled so far and would leave disappointed. I could work with that. He was some kind of genius, and I wasn't going to outsmart him. He'd maintained a steadfast silence for months, so pressuring him seemed unlikely to succeed. Ultimately, I decided as I drifted off to sleep, the best path forward was simply to appeal to his humanity. And if that didn't work, at least I could tell my friends I'd been to Tregear. The next evening, Hamilton called up to my room right on time, and I found him in the lobby. We walked together to the near-empty hotel restaurant and were seated immediately. In a black sweater, black pants, and glasses, he appeared studious, a look enhanced by the, blue, uh, by the two blue loose-leaf binders under his arm. The waiter came by and handed us a drinks menu. It's on me, I said. Nothing, thanks, Hamilton said. Nothing? You sure? A beer? He explained that he didn't like beer. On occasion, he told me he'd order a ginger beer. I had discovered a very rare breed, the one Australian who did not drink beer. <laughs> Beyond appealing to Hamilton's humanity, my plan for this evening included only one other essential component, having a few drinks with this guy in hopes he'd open up. The plan was now crushed like so many empty cans of Foster's. The waiter went off to fetch dinner menus and bread. This is for you, Hamilton said. He slid one of the binders across the table. I opened it and began to flip through. It contained 59 pages of his research notes on Shapira. Printed in a tiny font, the material had been divided into 12 sections, including an extensive bibliography. Chapters included headings like Shapira, biographical information, bibliographic review of the Shapira affair, and what happened to the manuscript after 1883. Each section was methodically detailed, heavily footnoted, and laid out with forethought and clarity. There were charts, photographs, and diagrams. One figure meant to illustrate how information had passed from one scholar to another looked more like schematics for the Airbus A380 than anything to do with the Bible. Hamilton, it seemed to me, had missed nothing. Enthralled by his thoroughness as I paged through the document, I began to notice that certain lines and passages were blacked out. Just a few at first, until, toward the end, entire pages were obscured. You'll notice I redacted any mention of the name, Hamilton said. <laughs> He'd been as thorough in his redaction as in the compilation of this amazing file. Whether it appeared in the text, a chart, or a footnote, every reference to the name or anything that might lead me to it had been covered over. He hadn't simply taken a black pen to these references, but in an effort to make certain I could not peek through from the back of the page, for example, or attempt to read them beneath some special light, he had used his word processing program to black out each reference. Hamilton ordered the prawn curry. I have absolutely no recollection of what I ate. For the next three hours, we talked around the issue. He was generous with his research. Aside from the name, he was willing to divulge and elaborate on everything he discovered over the course of years investigating Shapira. The details of what he said were familiar to me, but his analysis was impressive. His familiarity with the literature on Shapira had allowed him to trace how bits of misinformation had come down to modern investigators, like us, as received wisdom. He had spent uncountable hours transcribing long articles in German into Google Translate, then passed endless days making sense of the mangled English that had emerged. I didn't push him to divulge anything more than he was willing. Instead, I expressed genuine astonishment at what he'd accomplished. We finished our entrees, and the waitstaff bust our plates. As we continued talking over the empty table, 
Hamilton began to let slip little details about the circumstances of his discovery. He'd come upon the name, he told me, during a Google search. He began by entering an enormous variety of search terms and combinations thereof, buyer, collector, auction, auctions, manuscript, purchase, Shapira, and hundreds, maybe thousands more, combined and recombined. Then he read through the results, all of them. Rather than stopping after the first page of Google hits, at which point the relevance of the links typically tapers off, he continued reading. He proceeded this way carefully, methodically, for hours until finally one night in November 2011, an intriguing hit popped up in Google Books. It was an obituary that had appeared in an obscure journal having nothing at all to do with the Bible or archaeology. But all Hamilton could see was the brief abstract describing the article, not the article itself. And so he deepened his search, trolling through a mountain of online information for the actual publication to determine if he discovered what he thought he'd discovered. At four in the morning, he found it. And, Hamilton told me, it said exactly what he'd hoped it would say. The name became the eventual possessor of the notorious Shapira manuscript. I was stunned. Scholars had been searching for this information for decades. I had traveled ceaselessly to find it. And Hamilton had found it sitting in the comfort of his chair, 30 miles outside Sydney, and eight feet from his ironing board. This, it seemed to me, was a testament to the power of the internet and to this man's dogged skills as a researcher. I hadn't been taking notes during dinner because I didn't want to risk spooking him. I'd long ago learned that subjects reluctant to give you information that you want are allergic to notebooks and tape recorders. But I did not want to forget a single thing Hamilton was telling me. I was hopeful that with all this information, I could return to my room when he'd left and begin to plug a host of new search terms into Google that would lead me where they'd led him. I excused myself and headed for the bathroom. On the way, I snatched a few cocktail napkins from the bar and locked myself inside a stall. And there, I furiously wrote down everything Hamilton had just told me. Obituary, Google Books, Obscure Journal, Notorious Shapira Manuscript. I was in there a while. <laughs> and some poor guy was knocking repeatedly at the door, desperate to get in. I was afraid that if I relinquished the stall, I'd lose my train of thought and much of what Hamilton had said would disappear, so I kept writing. When I was done, I flushed and opened the door. A young kid pushed by me without making eye contact, head and shoulders bowed like he was walking into the wind. I stuffed the napkins into my back pocket and sat down at the table. So, Hamilton said, was it worth it, coming all the way to Australia? I didn't want to be rude. He'd just spent three hours with me, had made me a copy of his research, answered all my questions. He'd been less forthcoming than I'd hoped and more than I reasonably could have expected. Also, I was growing increasingly convinced that maybe he'd already told me enough. So I demurred, mumbling something about how nice it was to finally meet him and to see his copious research firsthand. Then Hamilton excused himself to use the restroom. As he rose from the table and walked toward the back of the room, I noticed that he had left his own unredacted research folder on the table, not 10 inches from my hand. My eyes shot up, searching the room. My heart kicked in my ribs. I felt like a pickpocket who'd spotted a rich lady's purse on a lunch counter. I couldn't believe he just left it sitting there. Maybe my earnest approach had worked. I'd earned his trust, and he now felt comfortable enough to leave the binder behind, but what good was this trust if I didn't then use it to my advantage? Maybe he just didn't want to bring a binder into the bathroom. Or was this something else? Something, frankly, biblical. Maybe I thought Hamilton was testing me. I glanced around the room again to see if he was peeking at me from behind the wall by the bathroom but he wasn't. Now I had a decision to make. Opening the binder was unquestionably the wrong thing to do, nothing short of stealing. And if I was to succeed in this search, I did not want to feel that the achievement was tainted, but I also knew that opening Hamilton's book could save me. I needed the name, and there it was, inches away. Salvation was at hand, and I was dithering. I knew, knew, that if I didn't grab the book, I would kick myself for days, weeks, forever. This was my job. To let it go to waste would be irresponsible. If I waited any longer, Hamilton would be back and the decision would be made for me. I was left with only my gut to guide me. Hamilton returned a couple of minutes later. Sitting back down, he set his hand gently on the binder's cover. I don't know if he was assessing its location or just using it for balance, but it hadn't moved. <laughs> 
I hadn't touched it. But something in Hamilton's demeanor had changed. Now he began asking me questions. If you had the name, what would you do with it? When is the book due? When will it be published? I answered to the best of my ability. The truth was, the answers had much to do with him. If he gave me the name, my publisher might push back my deadline, allowing me uh, time to track down leads. I wasn't entirely sure what he was getting at with his new line of inquiry, but my answer satisfied. Because then, three and a half hours after we sat down to eat, 36 hours after I'd landed in Australia, and about 5,832 hours after he'd first sent me an email inquiring into my research, Hamilton simply blurted it out. And I'll stop there. <laughs> and thank you. Happy to take any questions there are. Except for one. <laughs>